So we're going to talk tonight about how user experience can make anything that you're working on better. Um, user experience is very commonsensical. So hopefully, I'll probably say a lot of things you're like, duh. But hopefully, when it all comes together, you'll be like, you'll, you'll come away with something. Um, also, I'm kind of a rapid fire talker, so feel free to stop me, slow me down if you need to. Um, feel free to shout out questions. I like real cash kind of presentations. Um, I'm trying to think of, there was one more thing I wanted to ask you guys and I forgot. But here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to kind of get in the mood, the UX mood. So I want you guys to put yourself in the user's shoes. Don't think about this like a designer. And I want you to think about what's one of your favorite websites or mobile apps? And why do you like using it so much? And then what is one of your least favorite? And why do you dislike using it so much? And I'll start you out, and then I want a couple of you to shout out. So I love Evernote. Does anybody use Evernote? Yeah? Um, you haven't? It's just basically a whole bunch of notes organized into notebooks. And so I, wrote, I just wrote a book, and I wrote the whole book in it. Like every chapter was a note. <laughs> and all my notes for this um, talk are in there, too. And you can do it across all your different, you know, your iPad and your phone and all that stuff. And then I love Waze. And my favorite thing is when it says, police reported ahead. And then you <laughs> look at your thing, and you're like, shit. And you slow down. <laughs> so those are my two of my favorites. And then two of my least favorites are Snapchat, because I can't figure out what. It's like circle, circle, cir circle, circle. Um, so these are my dogs. That's like the best part about Snapchat is I got them in the picture. And then iTunes, which every time I get a new phone or there's some kind of upgrade or I can't get my podcasts, I'm like, I, I just, it's impossible. So even though it looks really pretty, I can't figure out how to use it. Um, so how about you guys? Anybody got one? Oh, Anything that has a .gov on it. Oh, a .gov site? Yep. Yeah. Yep, I hear you. Anybody else? What's one that you like? I love iTunes. You do love iTunes? Oh. But see, that's what's so funny. So, yeah. <laughs> I hate iTunes because it makes me feel dumb. That's why, I do, that's why I don't like a lot of things. Like, Snapchat makes me feel stupid. And, you know, because my daughter can use it. She's just... So, like, anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah, because it's well organized. You like Very it? Very well organized. It's easy to find information. And when you go down a wormhole, you're not in a wormhole. Do they have breadcrumbs and all that good stuff? Yeah, it's uh -huh. just easy to pick another path and not get lost. Then, gotcha. Good. Logical. Anybody else? Probably like Google Flights. Google what? Flights. Google Flights? Yeah. Is that kind of like you can book airplane flights? Pretty much. Uh, yeah, it's just a search engine attached to them to look at pretty much anything that's not Southwest. I've never even heard of that. <laughs> oh. Do they have some kind of disagreement with Southwest? What's the deal with Southwest? Um, they don't like other places to show their own prices. Southwest has always been like that. I mean, orbits and other things, they can't show Southwest prices. Right. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize that. Okay. And you were, you were getting ready to shout one out, too, what'd you say? Oh, the WhatsApp application. Mm -hmm. I don't know that one either. Chat application. Okay. But I got my friends to get on that because my phone kept beeping all day long when they would yeah, start talking yeah, to each other. Uh -huh. So I finally convinced them to go on that. And it's nice because you can look at the conversation later on. And it doesn't and just sit there and alert you every single time. It mm -hmm. Cool. Oh, I like Hangouts. Google hang Hangouts? Hangouts? Yeah, like the video, uh, Google Hangouts, the video thing? No, not the, not the, the audio one for your phone. Yeah. Oh, okay. I used that when I was in Europe. That was so nice. Cool. To avoid all the costly phone calls. Right, right. Okay, great. Well, that's a good, good way to get started. So user experience, you guys have probably heard. It's kind of the buzzword these days. But basically, it encompasses all aspects of the end user's interaction with a company, its services, and its products. It's not just the screen design. Um, this is Don Norman. He wrote this book, The Design of Everyday Things, and he actually coined the term user experience. He used to work at Apple. So he's the one that first came up with it back in the 90s. So you often hear UI and UX kind of paired together. 
or confused with each other, or it's like UI slash UX, and everybody's like, what's the difference? So UI is really a subset of UX. UX is like the umbrella term, the holistic, you know, every bit of the touch points. Whereas UI is really just how a person interacts with the screens. So I love this quote. It says, something that looks great but is difficult to use is exemplary of great UI and poor UX. Um, and I would say that would be um, iTunes. OK, we'll say iTunes again. While something very usable that looks terrible is exemplary of great UX and poor UI. And I would say something like Craigslist. <laughs> it looks bad, but you can find everything, no problem. So that's the difference. And what did you say UI was? UI is a subset of UX, and it's just the screen designs. It's okay. the actual, like how the screens flow together and the elements on the screens. Um, usability kind of comes with all this stuff. And so what is usability? It answers the question, can the user accomplish their goal? Whereas user experience answers the question, did the user have as delightful an experience as possible? And you'll hear the word delight all the time, and it actually drives me a little crazy because I don't get delighted when I check the weather or when I book a flight. I'm just happy that I got it done. So the word delight's a little overused, but you'll see it a lot with UX. And I love this picture of the kids. That actually is delight right there. They're probably on Minecraft or something. Um, so this is Jacob Nielsen. He's kind of our usability guru in the UX world. He's been around for a long time. Um, Google actually has a poster of him that says WWJD up on their wall for what would Jacob do. Um, he's on their advisory board. So he says, on the web, usability is a necessary condition for survival. If a website is difficult to use, people leave. If the home page fails to clearly state what a company offers and what users can do on the site, people leave. If users get lost on a website, they leave. If a website's information is hard to read or doesn't answer users' key questions, they leave. Note a pattern here? They leave. They leave. You don't want them to leave. So you're not supposed to be able to take this all in. When you type in UX process and you look in Google Images, this is what you, you see pages and pages of this. Because <laughs> us UXers like to make everything pretty with colors and circles and all that kind of stuff. So this is actually the process I follow. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, although a lot of projects that I've been on actually do kind of <laughs> work like this. <laughs> And to be a UXer, of course, I did colored circles. But this is a real standard kind of design process that you can follow for any kind of project, whether it's a book or a film or a product or even your resume, if you're job searching, like a resume, resume or portfolio. So basically, discover is where you do your research. Um, it's where you understand your user and your customer. Um, the defined stage is when you actually plan your design around their goals and needs. You might organize content. You might create a structure for your website. It's kind of where you get things organized. Um, the design phase is an iterative phase where you sketch or wireframe, and then you prototype, and then you test. And then based on that feedback, you do it again and again and again. Hopefully, you get to do it enough that it actually you feel good about it, which doesn't always happen in corporate America, <laughs> I just got to say. Um, and then you get to the build and deploy stage, which in a, you know, with a digital product, that would be when they code. And then you get to the measure stage where you're analytics and you get to measure results. Oh, by the way, I see you're taking a picture. These slides, no, 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 it's totally cool. What I wanted to say is I'm going to put them up on my website as a PDF afterward. Um, and uh, the URL will be at the very last slide. So you don't have to take okay. pictures unless you want to. So ways to improve your UX. So you need to eliminate friction. You'll hear this word friction a lot with UX. So what's friction? So your users just minding their own business. They're on your website or wherever, and they're just trying to figure out you to know, reach their goal. And they just kind of walking along. And then that's friction. I love this video so much I'm going to play it again. <laughs> oh, not again, again. Next. OK, so friction equals interactions that keep people from intuitively and painlessly achieving their goals. They may achieve their goals eventually, but it's hard. So who has eaten at Under the Sun, which is close by? Do you, do you know, do you have a good guess for what's a big source of friction at Under the Sun? Yes. So here's the, to here's the top of their menu. I cut their menu in half. So let's say you go to Under the Sun, and you sit down, and the waitress comes up, and you, what are you going to do? You're probably going to order a beer. It's off the different menu. You might order a starter. 
And then you start looking through the menu and you see this at the very, very, very bottom. Under the sun does not accept credit cards or debit cards. We apologize for any inconvenience. By then you've already ordered stuff and everything, right? So they do have an ATM machine in between the bathrooms, but they do charge you, you know, a, an ATM fee for it. Um, there's also a Wells Fargo and a Chase nearby. But yeah, I know. It's just it's such a source of friction. And if you look at their their Yelp reviews, you can see almost half of them mention the cash only policy. So this one's pretty funny. Beer good, pizza good. Chicken and waffles, not so good. Ten different people serve you, and they don't tell you it's cash only until the end. <laughs> and then this guy, David, says, cash only, but staff extremely nice about letting mail payment in. So what they've done to get around this is they will give you a self-addressed stamped envelope, and you can mail your payment from home if you don't have cash or, you know, you can't get cash. To me, I, I don't get it. I don't get why they don't, why they make it so hard. They do have good food, but I don't, it's just a little bit hard. Okay, so this is at my King Supers near my house, and it's their giant bulk food display. Mm -hmm. So I was take, as I was taking pictures, there's a lady, she kind of walked in right after my picture, and she's down here at the pretzels, and she's got the thing open, and they're stuck. Like, she can't get any pretzels to come out. She's got the bag, and she's just sitting here like this, and they're up there, and she's doing this. Um, those little peanut butter pretzels. So what you have to do is you have to get a bag and you have to get one of these little tags mm -hmm. and you have to write this PLU number on this little tag with that pen right there on the counter and it smears because this is like shiny mm -hmm. and then you've got to twist your bag up and put this on here and if you don't do it then the cashier's like and they have to go send like the bagging person over there to try to find it. Um, I d I, there's so many ways you can improve this and I don't know why, maybe they just have reels of stickers with the numbers and you could just put a sticker on a bag or, I don't know, there's so many different things they could do. Okay, so this came to my inbox and they've got these two great new properties listed, but they don't have any pictures. Like, unless I'm really, really interested, I'm not gonna go to realtor.com and try to find these pictures later. That, that was just an opportunity missed right there. Realtors should be fired. Okay, Best Buy. So. I've got a $10 mouse up there in the very top left that looks, you know, like, a, like bumblebees. It's $10 off, great deal. And I'm like, what is all this crap? So there's geek, you know, it's like this geek thing, and then there's um, complete your purchase, there's a keyboard, there's all this stuff down here. And they even had to go out of their way and say, this item has not been added to your cart. This item has not been added to your cart. I mean, it's just, there's so many better ways to upsell than that, it's so bad. Okay, so has anybody ever bought one of those $9.99 Microsoft things through work and you get it's like PowerPoint, Word, and all that kind of stuff? So you kind of, it's kind of this weird third party way that you have to order it. So I try to put it in my stuff and it says, we are sorry, but we are unable to complete your request. Your transaction could not be processed due to technical issues. Please try again in 24 hours. <laughs> so here's what happened though, this is the even worse. When I closed this out, I noticed that my expiration date was wrong, so I just went and changed it and hit try again, it worked. So the error message is just totally wrong. And the 24 hour thing, I know, it was bad. Okay, so who has an iPhone? How many people set their timer when they're cooking and this thing goes do 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 and you're like, you're hitting cancel and it doesn't turn it off. What you have to do instead is you have to slide that little gray thing up. It's really bad. I, I don't know why they haven't fixed that yet. Okay, so this site is called All You Can Learn, and it's a UX site where you can get videos and stuff. It's not, there's nothing complicated about it. Every, ironically, because it's a UX site created by usability people. Every, so it times out after an hour, and every time I try to log back in, it doesn't remember my user ID, it doesn't remember my password, and it won't let me store it, like in Google. So, oh, it makes me crazy. And so they have this little part that says, we have a new look. Have, have thoughts or questions? Tell us what you think. So I made sure I did. Okay. There's the front of the bag. These are golden steak fries, okay? Who do you think the target market for this is? Just a guess, or some time. I'm mom. Right, mom. it's me. Yes. I'm 49 and I do all the cooking and all of the buying and I can't read 
I can't read that. Yeah. Just, I can't, I can read the history of the company. The history of the company is fine. I can't read what temperature I'm supposed to set the oven on. Well, and the, the brown background with the white. The brown with the white makes it even worse. I know, my husband was making fun of me because I was putting this together and I'm like, you read it. And he's going, you know, trying to, trying to be all tough. I'm like, you can't read it, can you? No. Um, okay, so speaking of my husband, this is LinkedIn. So he's dyslexic. So instead of sending $1,100 for a performance to disdogin, like with two Gs, he sent it to disdog in, like a place where dogs would stay at a hotel. <laughs> and it wasn't until like many hours later when Cassie's like, I haven't gotten your PayPal money yet. And he's like, really? And he went and checked and he's like, crap, I sent it to the wrong person. And so he had to cancel it and issue like at a refund issued and then he had to send her money. And so meanwhile, what PayPal does, even though it says that the refund was issued on the same day, it wasn't. What happens is it took like four or five days. And then it went back to, it took it out of my bank account, put it in some limbo somewhere, and then it sent it back to PayPal, and then I had to transfer it back to my bank. And this is $1,100. Um, and so I don't know how they can fix it. I don't know if it's a security thing or what. But like when you put in somebody's, I don't know how hard if you can read that, it doesn't validate like who it is. It doesn't tell you whether that email is real or who it belongs to or anything. So to me, it's like sending it out into this black hole. Okay, when user experiences go really wrong. Okay, here's the ballistic missile text <laughs> that came to Hawaii. And after it happened, the governor said, it was a mistake made during a standard procedure at the changeover of a shift and an employee pushed the wrong button. This is what I think of. <laughs> I just can't help it. <laughs> um, now, later we found out that he actually did it on purpose because he said he really thought it was a threat. But when you look at this UI, you're like, well, that was just, it, it was just a matter of time before somebody was going to screw this up. Yeah. What he should have clicked on was this one that said drill, PACOM, CDW, state only. But instead, he clicked on PACOM, CDW, state only. Oh, no. They're not alphabetical, they're not organized by drill versus, you know, real threat. And so they didn't have a way to, to send out like an a false alarm kind of thing. So they added that to the list, but they put it right here at the top. Oh my I know, it's really bad. It's really bad. To redefine that fast. I know, it's really bad. Um, so this website, you can't find the prices. You're like, where, how much is this doohickey pet tool? You actually have to click in the drop down and then it has it in there. I know. Okay, here's Adobe. Um, this, this was about a year ago when I took this screenshot. It's really pretty, and they talk about you know, how they use their software to create this beautiful picture of this bear, but all their navigation's hidden. It's all under this, ham it's called a hamburger icon because it looks like a Big Mac, you know, like three little stacks. Um, it's all hidden under there, so you can't see anything. Um, so they've changed it, and I went, it's not prettier, for sure, but they've, they've taken all the navigation and they've put it up in the top where you can see it, and it recognized that my creative cloud was open, so it went ahead and gave me options for my settings and all that kind of stuff. So at least it's, you can do stuff instead of just looking at pictures and then trying to find your navigation. Okay, so this is the story of the $300 million button. So Jared Spool, um, he's a usability expert. He was helping, they call it a major retail site, but I'm pretty sure it's Target like when you look at the numbers of the, the costs and everything. He was helping them redesign their <laughs> checkout process when he noticed that many of the usability test participants were getting hung up on a screen right before checkout. It showed up right when they had filled up their cart and then they clicked checkout and then it, it sent them this screen. Okay, it kind of looked like this. It said, yeah, there's an email address, password, and then it says log in or register. So a lot of the test participants already had a Target account. I'm just going to say Target because it's easier. But they couldn't remember their password. So to reset the password, send it to their email, and then they had to go through that. And then the people who had to register, a lot of them were really resentful. And one of them's like, I'm not here to enter into a relationship. I just want to buy something. <laughs> so they changed it. They changed it so that it says log in or continue. And you're seeing this pattern a lot now. Like this was a few years ago. And it says, you do not need to create an account to make purchases on our site. Simply click continue to proceed to checkout and then you can create an account. So what happened was 45% increase in sales. Whoa. Wow. Which was $6 million a week 
It was consistent for a year. They made $300 million because they changed that one button. Wow. I know, pretty crazy. So now I ask you guys, where or how are you making it hard for people to do business with you? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> but I hope it's not as bad as that Hawaii example. Um, okay, so how do you eliminate friction? So I'm going to show you some examples of what a customer journey map is, but it's a really cool way to identify kind of potential weaknesses or areas where people might be confused. Um, also, tweak things versus redesigning if you can. Like, there's no need to redesign your entire website if there's one little thing wrong. It may just be a matter, just like that last example, of changing the label on a button or moving things around a little bit or adding a little more text. You know, you don't have to redesign the whole thing. And then recruit friends and family to help you test your whole and an experience. So I know this is really busy and crazy to look at. Yeah, yeah. This is a customer, this is a customer journey map done by Adaptive Path and it was done for Rail Europe. So it's complicated. But let me just walk you through really quick. So if you look across the top, you've got the research and planning phase where they're trying to decide, you know, who they're gonna buy tickets for to go on this trip. The shopping phase, so they're pricing it out. They're booking the tickets, post booking but before the travel travel and then post travel and this is just showing like the places where they did research and then it's just showing like how they felt during each little stage and then at the bottom it's just opportunities so if you look at a template like this and i'll pass a few around i'm going to reach over to one of you guys thanks so if you did this for your own business and i know it's like it's a saturday afternoon experiment but across the top you've got the stage so you've got awareness and then consideration research, decision purchase, and then post experience. And then the touch points are all the areas where they would interact with you. Not necessarily your website. It could be Facebook, it could be Etsy, it could be email, you know, wherever you're, that they touch with you guys. Um, and then here's like what, what their actions are for each step, their motivations, their questions, their pain points, and then their experience, is it positive, neutral, or negative? And then ideas for improvement. So what I did was I just did one little section for my husband's site, just so you could kind of see. So he has a website called Halftime Dogs. He does um, halftime shows for basketball, football with our dogs. They do frisbee and tricks and they jump over. Um, so I said, okay, awareness and discovery. How do they, what are the touch points? Where do they hear about us? So we send some people postcards. Um, they might see a show at a game, an actual halftime show. They might see a video shared on Facebook. There might be other things. Those are the ones I could think of right at the top of my head as I was doing this at the last minute this afternoon. Um, what actions might they take? They would do a Google search. They might talk with other athletic directors because that's his target audience is athletic directors. Um, they might watch other schools' halftime shows. Um, what kind of motivations? They want a great halftime show for one of their big games. They want to entertain fans. Um, questions. Uh, what can I find that is guaranteed to make the fans happy might be a question that they would ask. Pain points, budget constraints. A lot of them are real tight about like how, you know, the bit of barter back and forth. Scheduling, finding somebody available for that particular game is hard. And then um, customer experience, I put a meh face because I don't know, they're probably just not happy or sad right then. They're kind of just thinking about it. And then uh, ideas for improvement. So I thought like, oh, um, we could customize the postcards based on what kind of sporting event it was because right now his is basketball. It's one of the dogs jumping over a mascot on the, in the basketball game. Um, so we could do one where he's out on a field or something. And then... I have one question. Was yeah. There a need? Did he come up with this because there was a need or he just thought there was a market for that at the beginning? Well, there's kind of a need and a market. So there's actually a pretty big market. There's hundreds and hundreds of basketball games and football games and soccer games and rugby games and all kinds of stuff and the halftime portion of it is kind of the specialized little niche where you have to have a five minute show and he kind of sells it as a it's just me and the dogs and some frisbees there's no setup there's no hassle you know so he's actually doing pretty well um, although we're finding that it's very based on what kind of sport like basketball season it was like and then all of a sudden now it's the NCAA and like everything's you know it's in tournament time so there's no more basketball games. So now it's like, well, now what do we do? Um, and so I also thought we could time our marketing better because we need to figure out when these athletic directors are looking for halftime entertainment because it might be that it's three months ahead of, it might be in July, they're looking for basketball. 
And, and when we get to the Google Analytics, you'll kind of see some of those trends. It's pretty cool. So this is my favorite UX book ever, Don't Make Me Think. It's ridiculously priced, it's like 45 bucks. Although I think if you get it on Amazon, it's cheaper. It's because it's color and it's all like glossy and shiny and everything. But if you can see it on Amazon, it's got like 1,300, five, four and a half, five star reviews. It's a really good book. It's, and it's really common sense, it's easy to read, it's funny. So the guy that wrote it, Steve Krug, he has this um, belief, He's a, he calls it the least you can do trademark. He says, when fixing problems, always do the least you can do. He says he's lazy, but it also makes a lot of sense. So he says, don't get sucked into redesigning your website if you can make a smaller, less drastic change that will eliminate the problem for most people. Always look for the quick fix first. Okay, so this is gonna be some rapid fire bullet points. I am not a business consultant, but it's such an important part of UX to understand the business goals and the user goals and kind of how they cross over. So how many of you guys have a business, either like a side gig or a, your own? At least half of you, okay. And actually, if you work for a company, like I work for a company and they don't know half the stuff, so you kind of feel like, hey guys, what's our, what's our marketing plan? Um, so you need to get clear on what you want to accomplish. The products, are, these are kind of duh, I know. The products or services that you're offering, how much you're gonna charge, what kinds of conversions do you wanna see? And a conversion is, it's, yes, it's a sale, but it could also be like likes on your Facebook or email subscriptions or ebook downloads or something like that. Um, what's your marketing strategy? Do you wanna tackle social media, advertising? Um, what do you choose to blog about? What's kind of your theme? Or on LinkedIn, there's some people that have kind of a theme on LinkedIn. They're always this motivational or whatever. Like, what do you, what do you want to be about? Constraints. Every project's got constraints. So is it budget for website, advertising, copywriting, photography? Is it time? Do you have a deadline, like a book launch or a product launch? Or how much time, if you're doing a side business, how much time are you willing to devote to the business? Because like blogging is a, really takes a lot of time if you want to do it right. And then technology, are you tied to a certain website that you already have, a WordPress site or a bootstrap site or something like that? You just need to understand what your constraints are. And then personal branding, you should be nice. If you had a logo, I just use a Google font. So I use like a script Google font that has my name and it just looks good and I don't have to design much. Colors, fonts, the tone of your content. So you need to kind of have a good idea of what you want to do there and then um, these are the kinds of calls to action that you would put on your website for your users. You might see this as CTA, calls to action. So subscribing to your email newsletter, reading your blog. I mean, yes, it's about sales, but it's also about these things too. These all are like funnels that, that lead them into your world. Um, calling or emailing you to, to get a quote, going to your store on another website like Etsy. And they could all be doing all these things from your website. Downloading a PDF like an ebook or worksheets. Clicking on affiliate links like Amazon, you can create an affiliate um, account and then you can put like books and products and stuff and when people click on it and they go to Amazon from there, you get money on anything that they buy. Um, following you on social media, going to your YouTube channel to watch videos and subscribe. There's all these kinds of things they can do from your website. So then now you gotta get to know your user. And this is such a big deal for user experience that they put user in the word user experience. So we call our, we call people who come to our website our apps users. And it, I know it's, it's kind of makes them sound like a robot or something, but it's just what we've always done. So I'm gonna keep referring to them as users throughout this presentation. Um, and, and really it comes from this idea called user-centered design, which involves users at every stage of the design process. Ideally, you, you involve them in research, planning, sketching, visual design, launch. You're talking to them and you're showing them your stuff and you're getting feedback and you're iterating all the time. So you need to identify what your users want from you and your product and service. What are they trying to accomplish? It's not about you, it's about them. And you see so many websites where it's all about the business and they're not, they're using their own terminology and their own jargon and their own stuff and they're not talking to the people who might actually want to buy their products and services. There's a sweet spot. So yes, the business has goals. The user doesn't care if you make money or whatever. The user doesn't care if you get 100 subscriptions or whatever. And then they have things that they want that you don't care about either. But there's a sweet spot where the intersection between the two come. 
and the better companies have a bigger value area. I like to think of it as a seesaw. It's like a balancing act between designing what the business wants and what the user wants. And we kind of sit here in the middle. That's the sweet spot. The trick is coming up with solutions that meet both sets of goals. Oops. Ah. OK. So here's an experiment. Choose the best chair. <laughs> I actually have a massage chair like that. It's really awesome. But so you're probably going to be like, well, what am I going to use it for? Who's it for? How much does it cost? You might see some questions like, and, and I got this idea from Amanda Gagliardi from Effective, Effective UI. They're a UI firm down in Denver. So she read an article and I was like, this is perfect for my presentation. So he, here are the questions on the left that you might be asking. Who's going to use it? How long are they going to sit on it? What will they do in it? Where will it be placed? How much does it cost? How long will it last? And if you're choosing it for yourself, you're going to know these answers over here really well. Like, does it fit me? Is it too big? Is it too small? Will I be comfortable? Is it ergonomic? Can I type in it? I can tell you, you cannot type in the massage chair because your arms are trapped. Yeah. Um, does it fit in my office? Does it match my furniture? Now, let's say that somebody else at your company is going to pick the chair out for you. They don't care about any of that stuff. They should, but they don't. They're, they want to know, can I get a bulk discount? Is this the best value? Is it on sale? When, uh, when will I have to buy another chair? And it reminds me of when my mom buys me Christmas presents. <laughs> I don't, I've never worn gray lace in my life, and these are a half size too small, so I had to return them. So, but she was like, I've got to get her a present, and this looks great, so I'm going to give her this present. <laughs> <laughs> so the way that we tackle this in the UX world is we create personas. Who's heard of, a, of personas? So about half of you. They can be really complicated or they can just be really simple text. You know, it, the whole idea is for you to understand who you're designing for. Uh, they're really for you. Um, you might present them to stakeholders. You may try to get all of you guys on the same page by you all agree that you're designing for Fred and Fred's a you know, developer and Fred's 37 and he has a dog. But in your head, you're picturing this person when you're designing. They're just fictional representations. Some of them are done from real data, and some of them are done from interviews and maybe stuff that you already know about your users. Um, and they describe user characteristics. So in my class, I teach the class here, the UI UX um, Design Certificate Program. So these are just examples. My students all do their own project, and they all create, I know, right, the one with the dog? Is that why you're making the face? Um, everybody created their own personas, and what I wanted to show you is that Every persona looks different, and that's OK. But they have real similar things, like they have a name, they have a description of them, they have a quote, because a quote makes you really understand like, what, they're, what they're all about. It kind of encapsulates it. Um, their goals, their pain points, um, you know, some other things that might be uh, re relative to only that project. Then you could even have one that's like a poster. And it doesn't even have a name. It just has the implementer. And then it has like a little bit of information about him and a quote. And then this one is what I used from my book. And it's just, it just is kind of a text-based of what this recruiter is all about. So an overview about her and what her goal is and her pain points, her UX knowledge, because my book's about UX, and then her interaction with you, like what she and you do together. It doesn't matter how you do it, as long as you, it's important that you understand who you're designing for. Otherwise, you're just making stuff up. So there's this other book called Badass. And it's written by Kathy Sierra. And I love her, her perspective. Because what she talks about is, it's all about making your users badasses, like making them successful. It's about what they can do or be as a result of what our product, service, experience enables. It's about them. So OK, pop quiz. This is from her book. I totally stole it. I took a picture of her book, so I'm giving her credit. Um, you've got A, this product is awesome. You've got B, this company is awesome. Or C, this brand is awesome. Which would you rather have a user feel? Which of these would be a better predictor of sustained success? And which of these feelings inspires more honest word of mouth? Any guesses? C. C? This brand is awesome? 
So we got a C, an A, and a B. Well, I tricked you because it's actually D. And when I read the book, I was mad, so I'm sorry. But so the, the real answer is I'm awesome. So she says it's not about our product or company or brand. It's not how the user feels about us. It's about how the user feels about himself in the context of whatever is our product, service, cause, helps him do and be. They may not actually say, I'm awesome, but that's the feeling behind their words. And so here's one more example to kind of help make you. So what we think is true is that they're sitting here going, oh, it's the most incredible thing I've ever seen. But really what they're saying is, I can't believe you did this with just that one app. You're amazing. <laughs> like they're not talking about the app. They're talking about what they did with the app. So our users don't bask in the glow of our awesome product. Our product basks in the glow of our users' results. And that can be anything, whether you're a consultant, you know, whether you're, there was a girl in my last class that was an astrology consultant. So maybe she makes them, they go home and they're like, oh my God, I've learned so much about myself and I'm a Sagittarius. And blah, blah. Like they're not talking about her. You know what I mean? They're talking about what they learned about themselves. It's all about you. So in order to get to all these things, you need to do your research. Um, I used to be a researcher before I was a UX designer. I worked at a newspaper and I was in the research department. So I, I used to, they called me like the dirt digger because I would go find stuff about politicians and stuff. Um, so I really, really like research. It's really important. So to help you understand your users and your competitors, I mean, Google's your friend, no matter what. You can they'll go to websites, articles, blogs, forums, social media posts, et cetera. But reviews are amazing. So. There was a company that I was interviewing with last week, actually, and um, I went and looked at the Gartner peer reviews, and it tells you all about, you know, what their customers think about that product. And then Glassdoor is where people who, yeah, yeah Glassdoor, people who work at the companies anonym, anonymously submit reviews about the company. Um, Amazon obviously has lots of reviews. Yelp has a lot of business reviews. Um, blog comments job postings and descriptions. You can learn a lot about types of users through that. YouTube, Reddit, um, and then user feedback that you might have about your own product. So from customer support, feedback, link on your website, emails, calls, social media posts, stuff like that. All of it is fodder. So this is my book. And so I'm not trying to promote it. You don't have to buy it. I'm just trying to say, when I was trying to figure out what to write about and what my niche was, um, I read the Amazon reviews of all the books that were similar to see what the users said. Like, did they, did they enjoy it? Did they think things were missing? What did they really like? I went to forums and Facebook groups where beginner UXers hung out and I read all the threads about portfolios and job hunting and all that kind of stuff. And then I read um, like a medium. There's a lot of great blogs on medium. And I read all the comments to see what kind of questions people were asking, what they were talking about. And I used all of that to come up with my outline and figure out what I was going to write about. How long did it take? Not too long. A couple, probably a couple days. I mean, I was, you know, I sat there. Probably, it was over Christmas. I didn't. So I kind of, my, I still owe some people some Christmas presents. But I did. I just sat there. And but you know what? You get caught up in it, and you know, and it's especially if it's a project of love, and you, like you just want it to be great. So you just. But if I had just written it without any of that research, it would have been a different book. And I probably would have put stuff in there that people didn't care or that had already been done a thousand times. So, so competitive research for halftime dogs. So I looked at other halftime acts like Zuperstars. Have you guys heard of Zuperstars? It's like these big like animal creatures that they name after basketball players. Um, skydivers, Red Panda, who's the chick that rides on the bike with the balances, the plates on top of her head. She's real popular. Other dog acts, etc. And I looked at how do they have their site structured? What kind of pages did they have on there? They always had an about, they had an active schedule, they had testimonials. And I said like, what do I like or dislike about these sites? Is there anything I can borrow? Uh, you guys shouldn't feel bad about borrowing. They, there's actually a whole book called Steal Like an Artist. Have you guys <laughs> heard of it by Austin Kleon? And what it's getting at is by the time you pick all the things you like from the different things and then you apply your own tone and your own brand and all that kind of stuff, it's totally different than their site. It doesn't look anything like their site anymore. But one thing I learned from some of these other sites is how important it is to have like an active schedule, which is up there in the red at the top right here, to show that you're busy and you're doing stuff. 
And then like these testimonials, you can't see them, but there's testimonials down here. And then this is from social media. It's just little embedded posts from social media for social proof, you know, that they're actually there doing shows and stuff. So it really helps to go look at competitor sites. So comparative sites are similar. So uh, in the last class, Maya was designing a uh, website for her brother for King Towing. So of course she went and looked at other websites for towing companies, but she also looked at sites that were similar. They were like local businesses because she just wanted to understand like how those sites were structured, um, what kind of navigation did they use, where they put the phone number, that sort of thing. So comparative is just similar but different industry. So it, establishing trust is so important. That's what's going to get people to buy from you, do business with you. So real quick rapid fire bullet points. Um, you need to have easy to find contact information on your site. Updated news, events, calendar. If it's not updated, don't even bother to put it up there. The same for a blog. If you can't keep it updated, it looks really bad to have a blog from 2007. It really does. Um, photos of you and your business location, if relevant, people want to see who they're doing business with. Testimonials on your website, and we know you're not going to put anything bad on your own website. So then if you can point to good reviews on Yelp or Facebook, Google reviews, anything like that, that's really good. If you're a Better Business Bureau member or you're bonded and insured or something like that, put that on your site. Pricing, if it makes sense. Like, I don't put pricing on my site because it varies depending on the project, who I'm working with, that sort of thing. But if it's a product and it's pretty straightforward, you should probably go ahead and put pricing on it. Um, a blog or a podcast that shows off your expertise. Does anybody blog or podca podcast? Anybody? No? You do? What, what do you do? I have in the past about storytelling and photography. So. It's hard to keep up with it. I've done probably three blogs in 10 years and I just finally, I run out of things to say. But it's one of the best ways to get C, uh, SEO onto your site, to get like real, because it's just real, it's free advertising basically. It's just populating Google. So if you can keep up with it, awesome. And then obviously social media engagement. If you have a lot of followers, comments, likes on your, on your pictures and stuff like that, that's going to build credibility. And then speaking gigs, like going to meetup groups and stuff like that. So measuring results. So there's a lot of ways to track progress. On websites, it's usually Google Analytics, or there's similar products. Um, Facebook would be friends and followers. LinkedIn would be connections. I think it stops displaying at 500. Is that true? Um, like you can see how many you have, but people, it says 500 plus or something for other people. Messages and in-mail, likes, comments, and shares, profile views. Do you guys all know how to look at who can view your profile? No. Lots of nods. You don't? On your LinkedIn main page, like oh, under, okay. your, under your picture, there's like a little dashboard, mm -hmm. and you can look at your profile views from there. And then sales is kind of another duh. And then email and newsletter subscribers. These are all ways you can track progress and measure results. Can anybody, do, I'm sure I missed some. Like anybody tracking, yeah. I just have a question about LinkedIn. You can, you can only see who's on, who checked out your profile if you pay, right? No, you can see, um, I think it stops after the first screen. Like you might be able to see the last 10 or five or something like that, which means you gotta go check every day, which is what they want you to do, right? Because I mean, if you're getting a lot of views, then they're gonna drop off. And also if you're hidden, like if you make it so that you can go look at other people and they can't see that it was you, then you can't see who looks at you. So it's kind of, maybe you have yourself on private. If you have yourself on private, then yeah, I know, it's links to like, come on, come on in. Um, so who uses Google Analytics? Does anybody in here? You do, you do? Google Analytics. So I am not an expert. They actually have a club. They do have a class here tomorrow night, I think. <laughs> um, I need to take one. This is my husband's site, and I know it's really small and it's hard to see, but I just went ahead and tracked the last 90 days. It's amazing the stuff that it can take. So okay, well you knew you were going like creepy. So he looks at school. You know he's he's got a very distinct market. It's colleges, football teams, that sort of thing. So he can look and see. He has the, America, the US map loaded and he'll just hit reload all day and he can see that they're coming from Iowa and he can go click at the network and it'll say like University of Iowa and he's like, yes, my postcard worked. And he'll even say, can we go on the website and go like, hello, University of Iowa. And I'm like, no, you can't do that. Um, that's really creepy. But what it also tells you is for the last 90 days, so there's 340 users and then there's 460 sessions. So that means some of them came back. Um, 
The bounce rate, so this is really low. A, a low bounce rate is good. What a bounce rate is, is when somebody comes to your site and they leave immediately without going to another page, that's the bounce rate. So if it's really low, it means most of them come to, that, to a page and then they hop to a different page on his site. So that's a good thing. And then they spend about two minutes average there. Um, these are all the ways that they came to his site. Like the bottom big bar is from Google search or some kind of search engine. And then the next one is direct. So they typed in his URL. The third one is refers. So if it was on another site, um, then it would hop over. And then here's the breakdown of the countries and all that kind of stuff. Here's the top pages. I mean, there's like, thousands of, there's this whole left navigation and it's really complicated and there's thousands of things you can do and there's special reports. So I'm just showing you the dashboard. So this is really interesting though. This is um, the device breakdown. So he's got 50, I can't even read this, 56%. You guys can read it better than me. His mobile users on his on phone is 40%. So it was really important that I get a WordPress template that was responsive that actually looked good on the phone because this old website did not look good on a phone. You had to do like that pinch and drag kind of stuff. And so we tested it and made sure it all worked on the phone and the iPad and stuff like that. That's a big deal. You guys should kind of, you know, for your own websites, that's pretty important. Okay, so turn offs. Cheesy stock photos like that one. They want to see you or your business or your company. They don't want to see like pretend people or whatever. Um, unnecessary pop-ups and modals. Those are the things that, a pop-up is just a window that pops up but you can still move it around and do stuff underneath it. Whereas a modal is when the screen turns black and there's only that one thing you can do. Either one of them are annoying if they're unnecessary. Which includes getting asked to sign up for an email list before you've had a chance to read anything. <laughs> getting asked to review something too early, like on Udemy. Um, they ask you to review a class in the very first segment. You're like, I, I, like I've, I've seen 10 minutes of this class. Um, and then error messages that could have been prevented, like when you're putting in a phone number and it says, like, er, wrong format, and all they would have had to do is just put a little hint with some dashes or whatever to tell you what to do. Fluffy marketing text, like, welcome to my website. You don't need to do any of that stuff. Um, not listing prices, articles that make you page through a gazillion slides, outdated content, typos, unprofessional or amateurish, audio and video that immediately starts playing when you open the website. Mm -hmm. I know, right? It's gotten so bad. It's usually not companies, it's usually like news sites are doing that. Talking about yourself in third person. Jimmy really likes you. Do you remember that from Seinfeld, the Jimmy? Mm -hmm. No, maybe I'm, I'm old. <laughs> But it's when people do that on LinkedIn and they have their summary or their profile or whatever and then you talk about yourself in third person, don't do that. Like just, just talk about yourself like yourself. Don't go crazy with the fonts. <laughs> Limit to two or three. I know this is Jessica Heiss. She's a, a very distinguished visual designer and she says, if you are using three or more typefaces, you're either, either crazy good or you're making a GeoCities website. Okay, best practices. So back here into Don't Make Me Think, he's got this Goodfellows kind of scenario where he says, okay, imagine that you've been blindfolded and locked in the trunk of a car, then driven around for a while and dumped on a page somewhere deep in the bowels of a website. If the page is well designed, when your vision clears, you should be able to answer these questions without hesitation. And so people don't usually come to your homepage. They're going to find you on Google and they're going to bounce over to your about page or somebody's going to post something on Facebook and you're going to link to that. Like people aren't just coming into your homepage and like following your little website structure. So if they do bounce in sideways, they need to know like what site am I on? What page am I on? What are the major sections of the site, which is like the navigation across the top? What are my options at this level? Where am I in the scheme of things? How can I search? So test your own site and see if you can do that from some page deep within. Testing. In the UX world, we test our designs and iterate based on user feedback. And if something's confusing, we fix it. It's not always perfect. Sometimes we don't have enough time. Sometimes we don't, there's not enough budget. But it, the more you can test, even with a couple people, actually Steve Krug says something like, one tester is 100% better than zero. Like anybody, if you can get anybody to look at it and give you feedback, even if they're not the target user, it'll help. 
Get your friends to play the role of one of your personas, give them a task, see if they can accomplish it. Um, it could be anything from reading your copy, to pretending to buy something, to subscribing, to viewing your portfolio, et cetera. Testing is really important. When I, for my book, I had 10 people read it. So, you know, depending on what your product is, but get people to look at it. Social media best practices. Pick a couple of platforms and stick with them. Like, don't try to do all of them, because you're not going to do it well. And, and really, depending on what kind of business it is, like Facebook is great for a local business, like that towing company. You know, you got the hours, you got the information, you got the reviews, you got that kind of stuff. But for like a photographer or an artist, Instagram would be a better choice, right? Um, something like that. And Twitter, I just can't even do Twitter because I talk too much. <laughs> like I can't, it's like there's too much, there's too little space to try to come up with that. Um, link all your social media platforms to each other, which I show down here, you know, on LinkedIn, you can link to your website, you can link to Twitter. On Twitter, you can link to your website. Over here on Facebook, you can link to your website. They all tie together. It shouldn't just be like lots of loose ends out there on the web. Um, keep your name in front of people and stay engaged. Don't wait until you need something from somebody. You just get out there and keep your name in front of people. It's really easy on LinkedIn. In fact, it's kind of too easy because if you like something on like Facebook, it says such and such, Caroline Woodward liked this. And then I see it because she's a connection of mine. So if you like 20 things and your stuff's just showing up in everybody else's feed, just so you know. Um, and then over here on Facebook, so one of my students wrote a blog and I just, I read it and commented on it. It's just a nice way to kind of stay in touch with people and not wait till the last minute when you need something. So be consistent. Be consistent everywhere. Similar pictures, at least from the same decade. Logos, colors, background images. Google yourself and see what comes up. So I worked with this guy when I worked at Ally and um, we, we needed to try to find his Skype name so we could talk to him for a project. And my friend Googled his name, and it came up that he owed $174,000 in back child support, and he had an arrest warrant in South Carolina and his mugshot. So we knew it was him. It was on the first page of Google. People are going to Google you. Apparently, they didn't Google him. Um, but people are going to Google you. So you need to see what comes up for your name and your business and stuff. And then you want the same copywriting and messaging on your website, your emails. I mean, this is all obvious, but it's also really easy to overlook it. And then all of a sudden you look down and you're like, oh my gosh, everything is so disparate. It all looks different. So don't do that. Okay, so tomorrow, I'm not going to have it tonight, I can tell you. But tomorrow, the slide deck, if you just go to my website, it's lisamernan.com slash BDA, and I will have a PDF of the slide deck up. And you can contact me at lisamernan at gmail.com. Do you guys have questions? Any questions? Everybody's quiet. It was a lot to take in, wasn't it? Lots of bullet points. Well, if you do have questions, feel free to email me offline. Um, I'd be happy to talk with any of you guys. I'm teaching another class in July. If any of you are interested in UI UX, we're teaching a class here. And then a lot of the things I mentioned, there's classes here at BDA. Google Analytics, SEO, WordPress, all that kind of stuff. Great. Thank, Thank you guys very much. Are there any like, good programs to test UI, UX, other than just going through the front end of the website? You mean to test in terms of, um, are there websites where you can put something up and have people look at it, like a usability test? Yeah. Yeah. Like there's a site called, there's a lot of them, but the one I would use is called usertesting.com. What's really cool about user, well, actually, there's another one, and I can't remember the name. Shoot, I'll try to, I'll put it in the, the deck. Um, usertesting.com, you can test other people's sites, too, and get paid for it. So you just record, like, a little 10-minute video where you talk through how you're using things, and then they'll deposit $10 into your PayPal account. So it's kind of fun to keep up with what people are doing from a UX standpoint, and then you can submit your own stuff, too.